Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Jim Crow Statutes in Alabama, 1875 to 1903. I'm going to share with you a teaching and research tool that I created, a compendium of Alabama race laws passed during the period of the Alabama Redeemer Constitution of 1875, that is, the years of 1875 to 1903. In addition to compiling this spreadsheet of laws, I wrote a detailed explainer of the project and hired a history education student at Troy University to write 4th grade and 11th grade lesson plans and testing instruments based on this compilation. I was motivated by the anti-critical race theory moral panic drummed up in the wake of the 2020 murder of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the 1619 Project. Taking the arguments of the CRT critics seriously, it's obvious that they object to educators teaching the conclusion that American society was permeated with systemic and institutionalized racism. So I asked myself if there was any data that supported that conclusion of critical race theory. I looked at laws because laws confer power. They confer and restrict agency, and they are the expression of the will of the social, political, and cultural hegemon. I looked at Jim Crow laws because that's our period of study, and those laws not just racist attitudes and night writing, systematized Alabama's and the South's post-emancipation racial caste system. So that was an obvious choice. Pauli Murray's book, States Laws on Race and Color, published in Athens, Georgia in 1951, served as a model for my work. In her book, Murray listed racial segregation laws in the 48 states, District of Columbia, and American cities that were in force in 1950. For my part, I limited myself to Alabama in a 28-year span because I was overwhelmed with just how many race laws there were. I found 416 laws that institutionalized racism in Alabama in those years, 1875 to 1903. Now, I readily admit that I undercounted the statutes, for I included only those that specifically noted race or that I knew from previous study privileged whites or discriminated against blacks through application without the need to mention race. In addition, my compilation does not include city or county ordinances. The spreadsheet contains only state laws, state constitutional provisions, and state legislative acts and resolutions. I've placed that spreadsheet of laws, my explainer, and the lesson plans assessment instruments in a Google Drive folder for you to use freely and free of charge. I'll share a QR code and a tiny URL on my last slide that will lead you to the folder. That folder contains Microsoft Word and Excel documents, and I believe it contains Google versions of two of those documents. My method of searching these statutes was straightforward and rudimentary. I downloaded PDF versions of each volume of the Acts of the Legislature that the Alabama Department of Archives and History had posted to the website Internet Archives. Then I examined the index of those acts of the legislature to see how that year's legislature discussed concepts and used labels. After that, I used the find function in Adobe Acrobat to search for race-related keywords such as white, Negro, colored, and even African. I read through the hits for appropriateness, then captured each one's information. I did the same thing with the Codes of Alabama as compiled in 1876 and 1897, which were scanned by Google Books. With the Constitutions of 1875 and 1891, which were transcribed by ADAH, I did what's called a brute force reading. I just simply read right through them. I prepared the spreadsheets with these fields shown in the far left column and completed as many as I could for each law and act that I recorded. The fields are 
state, because I foolishly thought I might go beyond Alabama, year, session, general or local volume, the volume title, because they varied over time, the act number, the act title, the section or part, the quotation of the phrase, the page where the phrase appears, the type, the purpose, and eventually a link. The type and purpose fields require further discussion. I designated five types of statutes based on general areas that I thought they affected. Accommodations, education, employment, equal treatment, and voting. These categories are not at all rigid, and I'm happy to have other people refine them and their applications. Same with the purpose of the law. I identified four. Criminalization, adding a cr criminal penalty, just like a fine or an imprisonment, often to an otherwise seemingly innocent act, like a sharecropper selling cotton to someone besides the landlord or selling after dark. Discrimination, when an act imposes a materially different penalty on African Americans than on whites, such as race-specific distribution of poll tax revenue. Privilege, for example, choosing the state flag based on the St. Andrew's Cross of Scotland, or designating as state holidays the birthdays of Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee. And the fourth is segregation. That is simply drawing a line between whites and blacks, such as requiring local school districts to create race-based schools. Then lastly, I created a combination of segregation and discrimination. I believe this was needed because when I recorded an act of the legislature, I combined its sections into a single entry rather than counting the sections separately. Those laws often contain one section that segregated and another that discriminated, and we'll look at that uh, a little bit later on. The links are inserted now. They will point to the online page where the code section, act section, or constitutional article appear. Now let me give you some examples of what I found and then show you some charts about how these laws break down. My first example is Article 8 of the Constitution of 1875. That's on the left. It gives the qualifications for voting and is race neutral in its language. A male citizen or one who declares his intention to become a citizen, minimum age of 21, who has resided in the state for a year, in the county for three months, in the precinct for 30 days, is qualified to vote upon payment of the $1.50 poll tax to fund schools. The type of this constitutional article is, of course, voting. And the purpose is discrimination because it materially harms black people and poor whites who moved frequently for work and sometimes did not have fixed abodes. Those qualifications tightened in Article 180 of the 1901 Constitution shown on the right. A potential voter had to reside in the state for two years, in the county for one year, and in the precinct for three months immediately preceding the election. Their poll tax of $1.50 per year became cumulative. To vote, they had to pay current and all past due poll taxes. Again, the purpose of this law is discriminatory in my schema because it works a material harm to the people on the lowest economic rung. It adds other voting restrictions, a literacy test, employment requirements, and disqualifications for a long list of crimes, including vagrancy. But the 1901 Constitution adds an out for some preferred voters through the so-called grandfather clause. The grandfather clause worked this way. If you were, quote, the lawful descendant of persons who served in the American Revolution, or the War of 1812, or the War with Mexico, or in any war 
with the Indians or in the war between the states or in the forces of the Confederate States or the state of Alabama, unquote, the literacy test did not apply. That quote comes from the law. These constitutional provisions are things we're all familiar with. And as strange as they are, the acts of the legislature are even stranger, in part because so many of them are local acts. My next example concerns education acts, that is, acts of the legislature. Under the 1875 Constitution, the legislature had to approve almost everything that happened at the local governmental level, though the legislature could do that through law rather than through constitutional amendment, which is what happens under the 1901 Constitution. This was aggravated by an 1887 ruling by the Alabama Supreme Court that school districts could levy taxes only if they were municipal corporations. So we see a dramatic jump in education acts beginning in 1888 and really climbing 1896 through 1901. Almost all of these are local bills that establish school districts as municipal corporations with the power to collect and distribute tax funds. Almost all of these local acts repeat two formulae important to us. One enumerates the number of white and black schools the district will create, and the other repeats that poll tax distribution will be by the race it was collected from. That is, white poll taxes went to white schools, black poll taxes went to black schools. This is important because until 1891, public school, uh, until that 1891 Public School Appropriations Act, county superintendents distributed all funds according to the number of school-aged children of each race in the school districts. And they did that imperfectly, but that was the, the legal goal. The legislature changed the law in 1891 to allow local school trustees to distribute funds, quote, and again, this is a quote from the law, as they deem just and equitable, unquote. Although the act also includes the phrase, quote, and for the equal benefit of the children in the district of school age, unquote, that was honored most frequently in the breach. My final example concerns equal treatment. In the equal treatment type of act, I included anti-miscegenation laws, vagrancy laws, laws that specified that only white people had agency, for example, to sit on juries, to accept served processes, etc., and laws that privileged Confederate veterans or paid for Confederate monuments. Then, in 1903, the so-called local option law led to an increase in equal treatment discrimination by application. We'll see this in just a minute. Local option was a temperance law in which the legislature incorporated liquor dispensaries, what we call today state stores or ABC stores. They made a few of these in localities that wanted them. These laws designated what body was in charge of the dispensary, a, a board of trustees or the municipal uh, board, city council, and importantly, how much the manager had to post as a performance bond. Although the dispensary laws did not mention management being limited by race, the cost of bonds from 250 to $2,000 was beyond the reach of black residents. Some of these laws did discriminate in distribution of profits. The act establishing a dispensary in Ragland, Alabama, for example, split the annual profits between the town and, quote, the white public schools that they may be free from tuition, unquote. I did not count dispensary laws that allowed local trustees to set the cost of performance bonds. Given these few examples, let me show you the results of some simple graphs that I compiled from the spreadsheet. These graphs show only the 369 acts of the legislature. They do not include the 47 statutes and the codes of 1876 and the code of 1897, nor do they include the articles in the constitutions of 1875 and 1901. 
This graph shows the racial acts of the Alabama legislature by session and by type during those years. The dark blue is accommodations. This included things like the housing of prisoners, and later on it included the uh, creation of separate rail cars. You'll see that in the 1890-91 um, uh, bar on the graph. Orange is education. Gray is employment-related laws, such as charging fees for immigration agents. The yellow is equal treatment, and the blue concerns voting restrictions. You can see how this changes over time. With accommodations forming the majority of such laws in 1876-77, then education leading the way until passed by equal treatment in 1903. This slide shows us a slightly different view. This is the total number of legislative acts by type across the years. It confirms what we know from the previous slide that the vast majority of acts concerned education. But the equal treatment category being as high as it, it, as it was kind of surprised me. Again, most of that concerns dispensary laws in 1903, but I still found it to be a little bit of a surprise. In this graph, I categorize the, the acts by purpose, as you see here, criminalization, discrimination, privilege, segregation, and lastly, a combination of segregation and discrimination. And again, I felt this was needed because I combined all sections of a particular act rather than counting each section separately. Those acts often contain one section that segregated and another that discriminated. So let's look at the acts that both segregated and discriminated, and it's conveniently 100, and we'll break these down by type. You can see from this pie chart that 97 of the legislative acts that combine segregation and discrimination concern education. Two concern equal treatment. One concerns accommodations. Okay, now get out your phones. Here's the last slide. I have no real conclusion to draw from this project. I designated the spreadsheet to be a teaching tool, the most important component of which is the quote field in which the law speaks for itself, possibly the link field as well. You can access the spreadsheet, the explainer, and the lesson plans from my Google Drive folder available through this tiny URL and this QR code. Let me state the tiny URL, https colon stroke stroke tinyurl.com stroke msy3u6x I want you to have copies of this for your use and to let other knows, uh, people know about them. It is fitting for anyone who uses the spreadsheet to disagree with me on the type and purpose of any particular law and to find that I failed to include every law that I should have. In addition, this will not stop the current assault on teaching racial history in the South. But this project will put into the hands of teachers a batch of primary source material that no one can gainsay is mere theory. And with that, I thank you.